All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. It's another exciting afternoon at Google, and it's our, our deep honor to welcome Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson to, to the program today. Um, we are, we're pleased to host them as, as they discuss their most recent book, which is entitled Paul of, Paul of Dune, which uh, fill, is the first in the Heroes of Dune series that actually fills in the <laughs> gaps between the original Dune and then events that have happened both before and after in the series. And um, I, I have a, a good personal connection to the authors as well. They, um, their books served as one of my first introductions to the, the world of reading and, and to, um, to sci-fi books in general. So I'm very pleased that, that, they've, uh, that they've agreed to join us today and to talk about their latest work. Um, and for, for Kevin, I actually first read his books um, back in the days of the Jedi Trilogy and the Young Jedi Knights. Uh, currently, he has over 16 million books in print on subjects that range from Star Wars to Starcraft to these most recent works in, in the Dune series. And then Brian also carries forth the legacy of one of the most popular science fiction writers of all time, um, from writing the biography of, of his father to expanding the series to over um, 17 books now. Um, he's exploring new arcs in the, in the Dune universe, um, along with Kevin. Um, Brian's books also top the charts. Um, both authors have been nominated for the, the Nebula Award, and also um, Brian picked up a nomination for the Hugo Award as well. So now, uh, in terms of our talk today, for the benefit of our YouTube and virtual audiences, if you have any questions or answers um, for later on in the, in the talk, please be sure to use the Q&A mics. And otherwise, um, please join me in welcoming Kevin and Brian. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> well, we keep on. Okay. We're a well-coordinated writing team, as you can tell. Yeah, Kevin, Kevin's left-handed and I'm right-handed. Yeah, so. uh, we, we can actually sign a book simultaneously. We've and by done. the way, it was 20 million books, not 16. Kevin will tell you that real yeah. quickly. Then. Brian's my fact checker, <laughs> so he does that. Um, we're we're <coughs> glad to be here at Google and, and to uh, be talking to our, our live 3D audience plus the virtual audience that's, that's out there watching us. Of course, the virtual audience is so, sort of at a disadvantage because they didn't get to eat at the Google cafeteria, which is a fantastic experience. I think we've heard more about the food here than about anything else, so uh, it was great. So um, since this is the first time that we've talked to Google, we'll, instead of just talking about Paul of Dune, we'll uh, go into a little bit of detail about um, how we got together and how we started doing some writing. We're now uh, just finishing up our chapters, or editing the chapters of our 11th Dune book together, so we've, we've got it worked out by now. We've had like 10 minutes of arguing and uh Seven minutes. Seven minutes. And yeah. then Brian apologized. There you go, yeah. <laughs> so you, you move on, you know. <laughs> um, for I mean, Dune was always my favorite science fiction book, and it still is. I think I read it the first time when I was in, uh, like, like 10 or 11 years old. And when I read that, I read a, a science fiction adventure story. It was a desert planet, and there were battles and, and uh, exciting things happening, and people rode giant sandworms, and it was a great read. And I read it again when I was in college, and all of a sudden, there were so many more things to that book that I never noticed before, all the politics and religion and all the economics and depth to it. I, I've lost track of how many times I've read Dune now. I think it, it's just become sort of a habit. You read the series and turn around, go back to the beginning and read the series again. Um, but when Frank Herbert uh, finished Chapter House Dune, and he passed away shortly after that, I read Chapter House Dune, and it it just stops. It's a, it's a cliffhanger and it finished. And I, I didn't know how the story was going to end. And I, I kind of kept waiting for uh, his son Brian to pick up the, the torch and finish it. But um, I was, as a Dune fan, I was doing that. But in the meantime, I was also a science fiction writer too. And um, you, your last book, or Frank Herbert's last published book, was a collaboration with you. Yeah, um, well, actually, Dad ended, not only ended Dune on a cliffhanger, uh, with an unwritten book, sort of like uh, Dickens and, and, Edwin, and the mystery of Edwin Drood. But Dad, the last several pages of Chapter House Dune are a tribute to my mother, uh, Beverly Herbert, who passed away while Dad was writing the novel. And um, they'd been a writing team. She'd been a creative writer, and in many ways as talented as he was. Um, and so I thought, well, that's where the series should end. But um, so I, I went for 11 years uh, taking abuse from various people saying, why don't you continue the series? And various wow. people, science fiction writers, some of them quite well known, uh, came to me and said, could I write it or could we collaborate? And I, I just didn't feel I wanted to continue the series. I thought my parents had been the, the appropriate writing team for that book, uh, that series, and it should end right there until I met Kevin. 
Um, and he's a, he's a dynamo of energy. And um, the two of us had a new energy for the series. Uh, and in fact, after we brainstormed, after we'd met just a few months after talking on the phone, we brainstormed. And Kevin actually went back and slept for days. He was so tired. And you can't tire this guy out very easily. So we really put it, we started from the very beginning just pouring energy into this project. Uh, we still are. And I think we've written maybe a million and a half published words in the series now. Um, and we've still got enthusiasm uh, for the project. And um, I'm very excited that we're, we're continuing it. <clears throat> well, to, to back up a little bit, when I I'd read all of Frank Herbert's stuff, um, and I mean all of Frank Herbert's stuff, not just the Dune books. I read all of his Santa Roga Barrier and Asadi Experiment and Hellstrom's Hive. Um, and he was a big influence on me when I was starting out training myself as a writer. I studied how Frank Herbert wrote his books, how he built his imaginary worlds, how he developed his religions and, and character interactions. And I learned a lot about how to be a writer. And my very first novel, which was published um, in the, in the mid-'80s, when I wrote the novel, it was, it was heavily influenced by Frank Herbert's style and, and its subject matter. And when I got the novel <coughs> sold to Signet Books, I was able to become a full member of the Science Fiction Writers of America. And one of the things that you get when you become a member is you get their membership directory. And, and uh, there at last in front of me, I had Frank Herbert's home address. So I was sort of a stalker in training. I was, I was planning on when my very first book came out, I was going to send Frank Herbert a signed copy. When the first book came in for me, I was going to autograph one to Frank Herbert and thank him for all the uh, inspiration he had been. And unfortunately, between the time that I sold my book to the publisher and before it could come out in the bookstores, Frank Herbert passed away. So I, I never got to meet him. I never got to send him the signed copy. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really kind of thrilled to be working with Brian right now to, to be looking at Frank Herbert's uh, notes and outlines. Uh, but I did make my own way as a writer. I published a lot of Star Wars novels. I published a lot of my own novels. I was um, getting pretty successful both on, on my own books, but also in, in playing in someone else's sandbox, I guess. And through a, a series of kind of interesting coincidences, Brian and I did get in touch with each other. And I wrote him a letter sort of proposing, why don't we pick up the candle and at least try to finish what Frank Herbert obviously left unfinished. But um, at the time, uh, I asked Brian, I said, did your dad leave an outline for the last book? Because it, it's not like we're, we're making up the idea that there should be another book. If you've read Chapter House Dune, there's clearly there's another piece to the story. And, uh, and Brian said that there, there were no notes. His dad never worked from notes. We were going to just have to, have to wing it. Um, and so after we talked, it was, why don't you tell the, the a magical finding of, of the interesting Well, notes. Kevin and I started talking on the phone early in 1997. And by May of 97, he and Rebecca came to Seattle, and we um, I picked them up at the airport, and we were brainstorming in the car, and I'm almost going off the road <laughs> trying to find notepads and things. And Kevin's looking in his luggage for his tape recorder, because we had no idea that all of a sudden these ideas would be pouring forth. But um, I really didn't know that my father had worked from a massive amount of notes. I mean, we found, uh, after meeting Kevin, I found 1,500 pages of his notes. And I thought they were manuscripts, actually. I, I knew he ha I had the God Emperor of Dune manuscript and some other things, and I hadn't gone through them page by page. And what they were were uh, his, his notes typed up, uh, his handwriting in the margins. Um, I also found that, and it's a long story, but it's in the, the uh, afterword to House of Trades, how Kevin and I found additional discs that had my father's handwriting on the floppy disk, Dune 7 notes. Floppy, so, you might not remember yeah. floppy disks. It's a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, but the, actually, but, these were the, the big phonograph records. So, so anyway, we, we, we found those. We found the, the more than 1,000 pages of notes in my attic. And then Kevin went to Cal State Fullerton. There's more notes down there. So um, we've accumulated everything. But it's, it's kind of very, very odd, some of the things that have happened. I mean, Kevin and I will be coming up with an idea. And then we'll find that idea in Frank Herbert's notes. So. Um, I think we're, we're on the same wavelength. And really, when Dad was alive, I was one of only two people that actually collaborated with Dad closely on a novel. Uh, one was Bill Ransom, uh, and uh, they did a trilogy together. And I wrote Man of Two Worlds with Dad. And I think by osmosis, Kevin is, is the other student of Frank Herbert. And so um, we're, we're, we're putting a lot into this, as I said. And uh, there's actually an incredible amount of stories uh, still to be told. 
But I don't know if we're going to be telling them all, because we just keep coming up with ideas. The other day somebody <laughs> said, well, what about the Muad'Ru, these ancient mysterious people? Aren't you going to write that? And they want us to write this and that, and I, I don't know. Every, <laughs> every time a book comes out, we get this, this slew of emails and letters that yeah. say, here's a bunch of other ideas that you can write. So we're not going to yeah. run out of the ideas. But um, we did, I mean, just, just to fill in, because we were talking about finding the, the notes and outlines and things. Uh, we did a couple of trilogies, the, the House Trilogy with House Atreides, House Harkonnen, and House Carino uh, was the direct prequel to Dune. So we, um, when we started doing our books, it had been, um, what, 12 years since Frank Herbert had passed uh, 11. away? 11. 11 years. Mm -hmm. um, and so we needed to do something to get people back into the Dune universe. So we wrote the story of uh, Duke Leto and Lady Jessica and their first battles with the Baron Harkonnen. And, and uh, how the planetologist is sent off to the planet Dune to, uh, to study where the spice comes from. So we did that, that series, and uh, when the, the first book came out, House of Atreides, it sold three times what the publisher expected it would sell. So there's clearly uh, a, a hunger and an interest in Dune out there, and that reawakened uh, our whole audience as well as uh, increasing the sales of Frank Herbert's books. Those more than tripled after we brought out our new books. And then from there, we went further back in time to tell the story of the Butlerian Jihad in another trilogy. Uh, and we wrote all those and, and set up some more of the storylines. And then finally, we did get to writing what, what Frank Herbert had called Dune 7, which was the chronological grand finale of the whole uh, epic. And that was Hunters of Dune and Sandworms of Dune. Um, I guess we should have mentioned before, we all these notes that we found and the outlines and the, the chapters that Frank Herbert had deleted and alternate endings to Dune Messiah and, and really interesting things. Uh, we collected those in a book called The Road to Dune. So you can, you can look at that as sort of the, the cream of the crop of Frank Herbert's notes. And now um, with, with Paula Dune, you want to tell them why, yeah, in, with, in how Disney, this fits in? In addition to The Road to Dune, the other good companion is uh, Dreamer of Dune, the biography I wrote of Dad. And it's, uh, it's my story of getting to know a man that I didn't think I liked when I was growing up, and he and I became best friends. Um, it's also a love story between my parents and, um, and when the wonderful things my dad did for her when she had terminal lung cancer. Uh, and it's the story of the origins of, of Dune. I mean, I wrote a 2,000-page version of Dreamer of Dune, uh, and the published version that you see is about 500 pages. So um, you'll probably never see all the rest of it, but... Uh, Dad taught me to, to overwrite things, and uh, I don't think he expected me to quite overwrite it that much. But, but by the time you get to Paul... But, but then you <laughs> cut it back. You don't leave it overwritten. You overwrite it, and well, then you, you yeah, cut it back th down. Th that's actually, finish, uh, finish that's that actually a style that, that, he, that he did. And so some of the very uh, best passages that he wrote, we actually found either at Cal State Fullerton or in, in various notes and things. So they're beautiful passages. They, just, they got chopped for whatever reason. Um, in Paul of Dune, uh, it's more of a character study than the other novels, and it's a direct sequel to Dune. And um, if, if any of you read Dune Messiah and were disappointed, you weren't alone. Uh, Dune Messiah was National Lampoon's disappointment of the year uh, because people didn't understand how a hero who could be so, so wonderful at the end of Dune could suddenly be so dark and... and foreboding and billions of people have died in his name by the time the first sequel begins. And really Frank Herbert was turning over uh, rocks to see what would scurry out, as he put it. He liked to examine uh, myths that we, that we live under and to flip them over. And so what if this hero who is so heroic and, 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 and you think everything's going to be wonderful by the time you, you go further into his life, what if it isn't that way at all? What if John F. Kennedy, for example, Dad would say, what if we all followed that charismatic leader off the edge of a cliff? And so science fiction writers, we like to warn about the dangers of technology. Dad warned about that. But he also warned about this particular thing. And uh, it's something to really, really watch. And Dad spent 17 years <laughs> trying to explain Dune Messiah. And in fact, uh, John W. Campbell, the legendary editor of Analog, who loved Dune, helped Dad with some of the uh, characterization, some of the work on Paul in particular in Dune. Campbell would not publish Dune Messiah. He said, my readers, the readers of Analog, do not like heroes with clay feet. Um, and so that book was serialized in Galaxy, and Dad spent 17 years explaining it. 
And really, maybe the controversy helped sales because the sales of Dune Messiah have been second only to Dune. So, uh, but a lot of people read it and they scratch their head after read it again. Even very smart people. So, we have ex we're explaining it in a novel form. It's uh, maybe a little more palatable. And and really, um, the, the the if you open up the first part, it looks like a novel. You get into it. We've actually just filled it up with his interviews. That's all that's in there. There's uh, not really much in there. And uh, he's kidding. <laughs> <laughs> You're being recorded, Brian. Somebody's got to quote you. Oh, on that's that. okay. Um, they won't take in, me out anyway, of context. Anyway, with, with, with uh, Paul of Dune, our, our publisher, uh, Tom Doherty, who, was, uh, who knew Frank Herbert and uh, was good friends with him, uh, called us up after reading Paul of Dune and said, At last, Dune Messiah makes sense. Now mm -hmm. I can connect the dots between Dune and Dune Messiah because mm -hmm. Frank Herbert left. Um, it's a 12 year gap that at the end of Dune, Paul's. Paul's this young, optimistic hero. He's overthrown the, the evil empire. He's defeated Shaddam. He's got the princess he's going to marry. And he's all gung-ho. And then Dune Messiah opens up. Um, he's a tyrant. Trillions <coughs> of people have died in his name. Everybody hates him. He's, he's strangled with his own bureaucracy, and he's kind of hopeless. So how does, how does a hero become a tyrant? How does, how does that progression happen? And that's, that's what we do in Paul of Dune, which, as Brian said, is the sequel to Dune. And what we're working on now on our laptops as we go on the signing tour for Paul of Dune, uh, next year's book is called Jessica of Dune, which is pretty much a sequel to Dune Messiah, because there's a, um, a large gap after Dune Messiah and before Children of Dune starts. At the end of Dune Messiah, Paul Atreides is blind and he walks off in the desert to die. His uh, uh, Chani has just given birth to his twins, and then she died in childbirth. His sister Ali is only 15 years old, even though she's got all these other memories with her. Um, Duncan Idaho has just reawakened from a, a Gola. But Paul's emp empire was not stable. In fact, it was held together with Band-Aids and chewing gum, I think, and then he just walked off into the desert. So this isn't going to be a stable situation. So Jessica of Dune is is the aftermath of, of Paul dying, or everybody presumes he's dead. And uh, we've also got another book called Irulan of Dune, which talks about the princess and how she becomes his, both his biographer and then his propagandist, and she's trying to create a myth of, of Paul, which may or may not be accurate. In fact, we've even got scenes where Paul is saying, that's not the way it happened, and she says, yes, but it should have happened that way. Um, well, and, and what should have happened in her mind, too, is yeah. she should have borne Paul's child. Uh -huh. She loved Paul. Um, so it's a, she's a tragic figure in herself, but we're building up to the, the, the maybe the grand crew of, of those four. Leto II, the, the god emperor of Dune, uh, we're doing a book called Leto of Dune. It'll be the third, third book we have under contract right now in the Dune series. And uh, that's 3,500 years between uh, Children of Dune uh, and God Emperor of Dune. We're only going to cover maybe the first hundred. Um, and it'll be pretty tragic. All the, all the people that Leto loves and knows will be dying. Of course, uh, he kills about, during the 3,500 years, Leto is going to kill like 20 Duncans. Uh, we'll maybe kill one or two representative Duncan Idaho's, bring them back as gold. Or three or four, depends on how much fun we have. Yeah, a couple doing of spankings and, and, you know, that kind of thing. And you do the spankings. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. <laughs> that's, that'll leave for you. Uh, so that's, that's Leto of Dune. So those are the, the Dune books that we've got. Um, we have other ideas that we could maybe uh, set something back after the Butlerian Jihad to tell the, the formation of the great schools, the Bene Gesserit or the Sukh Doctors or the... Uh, the sword masters or the mentats. Uh, that those are stories we could tell. Um, but in between the Dune books now, Brian and I have, after doing well, eleven books now together, um, we're starting our own big epic science fiction series that um, will be like Dune as far as a giant galactic canvas with lots of storylines and lots of um, politics and religion and ecology. But it's it's our own creation. We're not doing. Uh, only Dune stuff. We've been well enough practiced, and that one's called uh, Hellhole. So uh, those three books will be out, and we'll be alternating. We'll do a Dune book, and then we'll do a Hellhole book, and then we'll do a Dune book, so we can keep our, our batteries fully charged and, and well, throw so, our enthusiasm in. So next year, Jessica of Dune, there will be a Dune book, but then after that, um, <coughs> sorry. Yeah. Uh, wait, wait, well, every, <laughs> every other year, but yeah. we, we've done now, 11. well, 11 years yeah. in a row, yeah. we've done a Dune book. Um, mm -hmm. And for those of you who read some of the other big, fat, epic fantasy series and stuff, 
I, I don't think many of those authors manage to come out with their book every year. So we haven't let you down year after year. We've been on time and on schedule and, okay. and deliver our best stuff. And then Kevin has a seven book, Seven Sun series. I just finished my three book, Time Web series. Uh, and the third of that, uh, Web Dancers, is published this year. Um, so there's plenty of other projects. But Kevin's going to cut down to only, what, two books a year? <laughs> two now? or three books a year, which yeah. to me, I did seven books yeah. last year. So yeah. that's, that's a vacation, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so we could take a few questions. Uh, oh, and I want to say one more thing. You know, for those that were disappointed by Dune Messiah, and maybe those that didn't understand Heretics of Dune and Chapter House Dune, uh, we're trying to fill in a lot of the things that Frank Herbert uh, didn't live long enough to write. But as far as Heretics and Chapter House Dune go, um, those were Frank Herbert exploring these interesting layers that he'd set up in Dune of philosophy, politics, religion, and all kinds of things. And so. His style was to, was to let the people talk, and the characters talk, and really Leto the second when he's talking, God Emperor of Dune, is Frank Herbert talking. So it's really Frank Herbert just enjoying and, and exploring the additional layers that he'd already set up in the masterpiece, Dune. Uh, if he didn't do it in the same type of style, uh, well, we, he, he, he could get away with that. Um, but Kevin and I have a different style of writing. We'll actually show you where Dune was, was turned into a charred ball. Uh, whereas Dad liked to say it happened, and he, and he just wanted to move on to something more interesting to him, um, we tend to start with more of that... Uh, uh, we're kind of more of a cinematic... Yeah, uh, cinematic, yeah. ...the style that we're yeah. writing, but, yeah. but we're also writing four year, 40 years mm -hmm. after Frank right. Herbert wrote the original Dune. So it's, right. it's different. From the very beginning, we decided we didn't want to mm -hmm. um, imitate Frank Herbert's style. We're, we're writing the books that, that we are interested in, that we want to read, and the... Uh, the readership of Dune and the readership of our books is just like on, on this, in this beautiful curve going upward every, every year that we keep going. Um, and there, there continues to be more and more interest in the universe. The Paramount is in, is in the first stages of making a, a new version of the film Dune, uh, the, a classic Dune. Um, there, there were already two sci-fi channels, six hour <coughs> miniseries on Dune, which were two of the top three best or highest watched shows in the network's history. Um, also, D David Lynch's version of Dune has been very popular over the years. He didn't always follow the plot, but we like a lot of things about that movie. It feels like Dune. So, so maybe on the new situation, they'll, they'll actually follow the plot. They promise to. Um, and they'll have some of the, the swashbuckling, daring things that David Lynch brought to it. And maybe even some elements of... Um, of Lawrence Arabia because uh, David Lean was actually going to be the director of Dune at one time uh, when Arthur P. Jacobs had the project. So, you know, some things could have been, uh, but Dad was excited at least that David Lynch did make the movie uh, because there had been many, many attempts to make this complex novel into a movie. And uh, Paramount's got the resources to do it and they're going to throw a lot of assets at it. Well, and, and finally, <laughs> Somebody, it, it was kind of obscure, you might not have heard of it, but a guy named Peter Jackson did The Lord of the Rings um, and proved that you really can make an outstanding movie that is faithful to the original material and mm -hmm. you aren't, aren't constrained by things like special effects or the length of the movie or, or everything that we're, we're using that as a benchmark and we're hoping that it gets, gets followed for the movie. And uh, fortunately these days, compared to what David Lynch had to deal with, um, we don't really have any special effects issues. Anything you can imagine, they can come up with on the movie. They don't have to worry about. It wasn't Lynch having problems of how do you, how do you do a sandworm? Is it like a sock puppet coming out of a sandbox, or what do you do? And <laughs> and these days, you you know that won't be an issue. So they can do whatever they want in special effects, and they can focus on telling the story that they they want to. So, did we have any questions out there in the audience, or should we um, sign some books for our people, or? Um, actually, we have some questions here. And also, if we have any questions on our um, virtual audiences, too, we'll, we'll pipe those in. So something I've always been curious about, and I've read all the books you've written, which are prior to Dune, is how much of the, how many of the ideas were you know, your original ideas, and how many were from the notes that Frank Herbert wrote? Well, Dad and I talked about um, writing a single novel that would have been set in the Butlerian Jihad time. Um, and his, so basically when Kevin and I turned to writing the Butlerian Jihad, for example, um, we only had uh, what Dad wrote at the end of Dune, 
We didn't find additional notes to speak of on that particular subject. So we had his inspiration and his outline. And it was pretty much like that for uh, the, the two Dune 7 novels as well. We found 30 to 35 pages of his outlines for a single novel that he called Dune 7. Um, and um, we elaborated on that. But, but when Dad set up that outline for, for Dune 7, he had six novels before it. And by the time Kevin and I turned to it, we'd written even more novels. So it was like double. And so we had all these background threads to bring together. So um, a lot of the material is um, inspired by Frank Herbert, but Kevin and I have filled in the information. But before I ever wrote a word with Kevin, I spent a year putting together a Dune concordance. Um, I have a 600-page single-space concordance of every, um, every important description uh, that Frank Herbert had for what the Mentats were, the history of the Bene Gesserit. All of it I have in a concordance. And um, I was going to publish it at one point, because Kevin's published like 100 books, and I've, I'm pushing maybe 30 of them. I, I've got maybe up, up to 29, maybe, or getting close. And I said, well, I need another, I need some more book count here to catch up. And, and Kevin said, don't publish that. The fans will use it against us. So, <laughs> I mean, we're, we're only human. We're not machines. We, we may have a few errors here and there. But um, we, found in our, we found in my father's notes a scene of uh, where Jessica meets Duke Leto. And so Kevin and I inserted that scene into House Harkonnen, our second book. And that was actually Frank Herbert's yeah. scene that we sanded down on. It's kind on, of a surprising yeah, scene. I yeah. mean, she, she's introduced him for the first time, and he grabs her and puts a knife to her throat. And that's what Frank yeah. Herbert wrote, the, how he wanted that meeting to be. Yeah. Um, and with the, but another thing with the Dune 7 outline, uh, as we said before, Frank Herbert liked to leave a lot of things in between the chapters. He would, he would like, have the Otter Matres coming to attack the planet Dune, and then this next chapter would open up with, and after they destroyed all life on Dune, then he goes on. Uh, the outline he had for Dune 7 as one book was so packed with stuff that we thought, how can we show all this stuff in one book? Well, it's because we like to, we like to show the planet getting devastated and stuff. So we, um, we filled in the blanks, so we mapped out the story that he gave us. I mean, it's like he gave us the map with all the highways on it, and we actually had to make the, the journey driving across country. But, and, but another idea that is Frank Herbert's that you'll find in, in the series is the identity. Frank Herbert revealed the, the identity of, uh, of Jessica's father in Dune, but he didn't reveal the identity of, of the mother. Well, that's in his notes. Frank Herbert had that in the notes that we had, but Kevin and I already came up with the idea. We thought it was our idea, and then we found it in his notes afterward. <laughs> yeah, we plotted that. It was in House of Trades. We plotted mm -hmm. the whole part, and then we found all these notes afterward, and we're starting to look through them, and we went, wow, he did the same thing we did. So we felt like yeah. we, were, we were channeling Frank Herbert there. Yeah. Anybody else? Have there you go. So one of the big themes in Herbert's books is obviously man versus environment or, and how man relates to the environment. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and I remember reading at one point, um, Frank Herbert was sort of a passionate environmentalist. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could comment a little bit about what in Herbert's background led him to consider you know, uh, a science fiction novel, which is really, in, in a large sense, about man and environment. Uh, and even to the extent that it's sort of inwardly focused, it's sort of a uh, man's psyche as an environment that he's, he's sort of trapped oh, in. So like, that's, uh, it's, it's all over his books, right? So I'm sort of interested in sort of, uh, biographically speaking, what do you think led him to, to that sort of worldview? He was, a, he was basically a sponge absorbing information from all directions. He was a Republican speechwriter back in the 1950s. Um, he worked at the Library of Congress where they would come out, and instead of what you have here where you can get all information over the internet, people would come to him with carts full of books and he would just go through them and scan them quickly. Um, but he was always writing about what it means to be human in different forms. And so he thought, well, what if he extrapolated the situation in the Sahara Desert and made it an extreme where what type of people would have to live in that environment, uh, what type of religion would they have, and he wanted to make it based on sort of a, an Arab type situation. But he brought in linguistic elements not only from Arabic but from all over the world, from the Gobi Desert, from Navajo. Um, and um, he, he was, uh, in, in fact, the reason that Dune became so, so huge was because of the environmental aspects of it. But other than that, he was not an active um, environmentalist. In fact, he was critical of the extremes of the Sierra Club. He thought they should have negotiated with, with some of the developers so that the uh, forests would not be clear-cut. 
Uh, but he was a more of a an anti-war activist. So I, I guess that um, you know that the supreme uh, environmental damage is maybe caused by war. You know when you think about it on a huge extreme. But um, but didn't he also build like his his house that was with mm -hmm. tin cans to oh, heat, yeah. heat water in the mm -hmm. the roof and stuff like that? Oh yeah, like he, that? he he had a. Uh, uh, an, an experimental farm in Port Townsend, Washington, where he would get uh, beer cans, uh, cut them in half, and uh, have his friends help him, as he said, help him drink the beer to get the cans. And, 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 he, and he tested whether you have black, uh, paint them black or silver and all this stuff. And, he had, and it was actually heating the house in Port Townsend, you know, 30, 35 years ago. He was going to build an experimental uh, windmill that he wanted everyone to be able to buy through a Sears catalog. Um, he uh, uh, used methane from his chicken coop uh, uh, to, to develop uh, various things, and I pointed out it was pretty dangerous to be storing the methane in, in truck inner tubes. And because I was an insurance underwriter, I said, "Dad, that's going to blow, going to blow up your chicken coop." And so he he, he modified that a little bit because I'm a little more cautious than he is, or he was. Um, and, but he was also a, a newspaper reporter and mm -hmm. a freelance uh, writer, and one of the stories that interested him back in the late '50s is uh, by, by Florence, Oregon, there are a bunch of sand dunes. And the sand kept blowing across the highway. So every, every day, people had to find some way to, to take trucks and plow the sand back off of the highway. So there was a project put in place, an experimental project, where they were ecologically trying to plant different kinds of grasses on the dune slopes so that it would hold them in place so that the sand would stop blowing across the road. And uh, there was something about, he went to do an article about it uh, that was called They Stopped the Moving Sands and in, in the road to Dune, like I mentioned, we published his original um, letter and proposal for this article about he, he was amazed about the, the arrogance about people saying, well, we can, we can make the environment the way we want, we can stop the sands from blowing, we can keep these dunes from moving across the road when really maybe we shouldn't have put the road there. That was, I think that was what his idea was. And uh, didn't talk about how he, he took the plane flight. Well, over. He, he he flew down from uh, Tacoma or Seattle uh, to do this article, and um, as he was flying over the desert, he 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 started to have a bigger picture that you know sort sort of a Lawrence Arabia type picture of of, of desert tribes and and being led by a, a messiah figure. Um, and uh, originally, he had this magazine article in, in mind, and he sent it into his agent, and the agent said, well, there's not going to be much interest in this kind of a subject, so it was set aside. And then Dad uh, turned to a science fiction novel that he called Spice Planet. And again, that had the ecological message in it. It had the, the planet Dune, but a very simple science fiction plot that he probably could have gotten published very easily. And Kevin and I later wrote that, but Dad set it aside, and it kept getting more and more complex. Um, and really, uh, the Whole Earth Catalog, by the time they got to the final version that Dad published, the Whole Earth Catalog called Dune an environmental handbook. So um, he, he put it in a palatable form to get the message out to millions of people. Well, eventually, the problem was when he wrote Dune, it was rejected like 23 times because they all, all the editors said, nobody's going to want to read a 400-page science fiction book. And the whole audience just wasn't there. They didn't know what to do with a, a book that fat with its own language in it and, and cultures and things. But Frank Herbert persisted, and it kept, out, kept going out, and eventually got published by Chilton Books, which was a publisher of automobile repair manuals. And they printed <coughs> Dune because their editor was a science fiction fan, and he fell in love with the book. And we've, we've since got... Uh, some intimations in the background that the company didn't like this editor, so they were just looking for a way that they could get rid of him. So they gave him said they said, "Go ahead and publish Dune," like they were giving him the rope to hang himself with, and then it turns out to be this big success. So anyway, we we, we don't answer questions simply or directly. I mean, yeah, yes or yeah. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't a yes or no question. Well, I, I was looking, waiting, waiting for mobs to come forward. So uh, go ahead. So this is a sort of a follow up on the movie thing. Um, I saw the Lynch movie when it came out, and I rather enjoyed it, but I, I discovered later that I was in, in a small minority uh, in that <coughs> I'd read the book, but not so recently that I remembered any of the details. Mm -hmm. But it was close enough so that when something happened on screen, I wasn't confused. Right. And given the size and complexity of that novel, it, it seems like a challenging task to avoid, avoid that problem. Right. Well, the, the movie... Uh, Harlan Ellison wrote a couple of uh, articles about what happened to that movie, and uh, 
uh, Universal Pictures uh, filmed it, and um, they changed their presidency toward toward the end of the filming. And so a new president got a private screening on that film, and he hated the movie. He said, "This movie's a dog. It's going to bomb." And so what they did then is sort of you, you sort of see it like in in political arenas now. They only sent the movie out to reviewers they thought would be friendly. And so that made the other reviewers a little bit upset, more than a little bit. So uh, in the United States, these reviewers and other reviewers kept saying how terrible it is. And then I would talk to people on the street, and they'd tell me how terrible the movie is. And I'd say, well, have you seen it? No, but I've heard. But you know, the data point comparison is you look in Europe, in Japan, and in Australia, where it didn't have that sort of uh, uh, criticism uh, from reviewers, professionals, quote unquote. Um, it was huge. There were people lined up around the block to see the movie. Dino De Laurentiis, uh, supposedly, I don't, I haven't seen the figures on it. Supposedly, he made enough to build a, a movie studio outside of, of Rome, or at least it helped him, you know, build part of it. But uh, it's just huge, successful, profitable movie it was one everywhere. Of the yeah, biggest grossing yeah. films of the year. It made a yeah. lot of money. Although yeah. there's, you, you talk, there's some popular. Uh, understanding in the culture that oh Dune was a bomb and it didn't well no Dune and still what is it out now and it's like a fifteenth different edition on DVD it's a and, best selling and it, DVD it, yeah. it sells like crazy yeah. and it's yeah. uh, it was it didn't follow the book entirely and there are some things in that movie that uh, you kind of scratch your head like at the end the happy ending is that Paul makes it rain all over the desert which would therefore kill all the sandworms and wipe out the spice so that's not really a happy ending although they didn't seem to think of that. Um, you have to overlook parts like that and just see like the, the, the imperial throne room scene and those, those hammerhead ships coming in and the, the riding the sandworm and, and the casting in that movie uh, is really good. Um, but on the, on the other hand, the Sci-Fi Channel, the six hour miniseries that they did, they had the room to tell the full story. They had six hours and they really were able to follow mm -hmm. the plot very well. But while David Lynch was constrained by, by maybe the time on screen, the Sci-Fi Channel was constrained that they had, they, for their six hours and in 19, or in 2000 uh, time frame, they had less money than David Lynch had back in the 80s, I think. So they, they had $20 million. To so they, they had to uh, <coughs> do the miniseries on a much lower budget than, than you really need to do Dune properly. But, but they still got William Hurt and Susan Sarandon and, and people came in that, that really loved that project and the music. Oh, Brian oh, Tyler. Brian Tyler's music yeah, on yeah. The Children of Dune was fantastic. So, yeah. so anyway, again, we didn't a answer your question directly. <laughs> but Frank Herbert was like that too. His mind would like, you know, we're like little versions of it, mini me's, you know. Yeah, it's but, not a yes no version. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I gotta totally I gotta totally agree with you guys on Brian Tyler. I'm yeah. I'm actually a huge Brian, Brian Tyler, Tyler fan. Yeah, rocks, so, yeah. And you know what? He's a Dune fan too. He yeah. came to one of the okay. premieres and and he was he was so excited to, to meet us and we said, Well, we're excited to meet you. It was really and uh, I I'm still I send him like a signed copy of the books when they come out. Yeah. He's he's being very successful doing uh, lots of movie soundtracks mm -hmm. now, but I I'm, I'm partial, but I think Children of Dune is probably the best one he's done. So So yeah. would you guys do a mini series on some of the books you've written? And if so, would you get Brian Tyler again? Yeah, you're, you're assuming that we have any say in this sort of thing well, whatsoever. Well, yeah, Ke Kevin and I are co-producers of the new Paramount movie, but that's like way down on the food chain, and we're going to get like a blip maybe. No, but, it, but it, it's, very, it's in the contract that we're going to get equal treatment with other producers, but we're basically creative advisors, and they don't have to take our advice. Um, but we would advise yeah. using Brian Tyler again. Yeah. I think he really pulled out all the stops and did a great yeah. job on it. Yeah. But yeah, that's that's not our decision. But we'll mm -hmm. we'll do what we can. W would you do a Sci-Fi Channel miniseries for the Butler and Jihad, for example? We we think uh, the the talk is that there will be television in conjunction with a major movie. So it could be a God Emperor movie. I mean, it, it could be a lot of things. It could be uh, House of Atreides. Uh, we actually pitched House of Atreides to Paramount Pictures to start with, and um, they almost uh, started with that, but they changed their mind and decided to go back to the original uh -huh. Dune. But it's, it's Hollywood, so who knows what's going to come out of it. But mm -hmm. we're, uh, we're still pushing it. The audience just keeps <clears throat> increasing, and people, more and more people keep reading the books. So uh, everything hinges on this new movie being good. You know, if the if if the new movie works, then of course they're going to do more, and they will branch out in different directions. Cool. Um, well, I had um, one 
I had one question myself, and um, this, this sort of goes in the back of my mind whenever I, I see um, you know, such long and such um, very successful sci-fi series. But, so in, in the Dune series, you know, in the Star Wars series, how do you manage the complexity of you know, such a large univor universe and, and you know, keep all the facts straight? And how does that boil down to the, the daily writing that you do you know, when you write you know, a new chapter for a new book? Well, like Brian said earlier, by doing, uh, he did this incredibly detailed concordance of all the stuff uh, in the Dune books. We have all of the books on, uh, in text format so we can search them to, to look for specific things. Um, the fallback position really is that we just, we read them over and over and over and over again. Um, but right now we're up to, with our books and with Frank Herbert's books, we're, we're getting close to three million words mm -hmm. that have been written over the course of 45 years. So there's an awful lot of stuff to try to uh, keep track and where, especially when you're like Paul of Dune, which has so intimately worked into Dune and Dune Messiah, um, we have a lot of test readers, we have a lot of Dune experts that go over things. Um, we, we have volume after volume, but we, we do like 11 edits of each manuscript before it gets published. And Wait, which, which makes the first six books that Frank Herbert wrote even more remarkable. He, he wasn't using computers and he kept all this in this incredible mind. And there's a couple little glitches in there. You could call them maybe copy editing glitches, but um, and, and maybe we'll have a contest and let yeah. people find those <laughs> and, and find them in ours. Uh, but uh, it's remarkable that he did it without computers. So do you find yourself you know, going down a, a road to you know, writing a chapter and then is there a moment where you stop and pause and you know, consult the prior sources before? Or do you oh, constantly. You know, I, was writing, I was working on a chapter today and I noticed that you know, it, it happened to be a chapter Kevin had written in the current book, Jessica of Dune, and I noticed there was no eye color in there and I couldn't remember the eye color of the characters. So I went into my concordance and found it and inserted it. Bloodshot and red. Right? Yeah, <laughs> blue but within no. blue. But <laughs> so we were we were in Sacramento last night on the tour, and uh, we had, we were in a van driving down here to Google headquarters in Mountain View. It was about a two-hour drive or so, and we were both in the van with our laptops open. Mm -hmm. I was uh, answering some uh, some fan email and some letters, and Brian was editing a chapter of Jessica of Dune. So that's where we use every spare minute and keep going on it. All right. Well, um, Brian and Kevin, we really appreciate your time today. Thank you very much for, for spending time with and us. Thank, thank you for having us. We, we enjoyed it. Thank, thank you. you.